You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And it's spooky season, y'all. It's the month of October. <laughs> I didn't think of October as being spooky all month, but I guess it is. Well, do you love Halloween as much as I do? I don't think anybody loves Halloween as much as you do, Kristen Dilly. Actually, I do have a friend who loves it way more than I do. But for the purposes of this podcast, of the two people in this room currently, I love Halloween more than you do, for sure. <laughs> okay. We thought the best way to kind of get everybody in the Halloween spirit is to read some spooky tales. So as part of this bonus content, we're going to perhaps spook you out a little bit and maybe ourselves too. (laughs) Maybe. Although to be fair, I have uh, read this particular story with my ninth graders when I taught ninth grade, which I haven't for a while now. I have read it with them so often that I've practically memorized it. So it has lost the fear factor for me, but I do love telling it. It's always a lot of fun. And it's my first reading of the story. So bear with us. We'll give it a try. We'll see how we do. It's a lot of fun. It's by a gentleman whose name is often synonymous with horror. And that would be the distinguished Edgar Allan Poe. When I was a kid, not only did we read these stories, we also saw a lot of movies that were based on Edgar Allan Poe stories. And uh, some of them were very well done and pretty spooky. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And for anybody who is local in the Virginia area and you just can't get enough of Edgar Allan Poe, make sure you go up to the Poe Museum in Richmond because that is the largest collection anywhere of Edgar Allan Poe artifacts. And it is a lot of fun. It's a great place. Sounds like fun. Plan on it. Plan on it for sure. We proudly present to you the cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe, performed for you by me, Kristen Dilley. And me, Bill Thomas. Enjoy. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length. I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato. Although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking too much. The man wore motley. He 
He had on a tight-fitting, party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for a Montiato, and I have my doubts. How? A Montiato? A pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of the carnival? I have my doubts, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado? I have my doubts. Amontillado? And I must satisfy them. Amontillado. As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese. I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. As for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, and putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roccolore closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux and, giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montressors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe. It is farther on, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned toward me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Niter? Niter. How long have you had that cough? Oh. <coughs> 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 Quite some time. My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing. <coughs> Come, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as once I was. And you are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I will not die of a cough. True, true. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily but you should use all proper caution. A draft of the Medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults are extensive. The Montressors were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo mi impune la cesset. Good. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the medic. 
We had passed through long walls of piled skeletons with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The niter. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing. Let us go on, but first another draft of the medic. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend? Not I. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yes. You? Impossible. A Mason? A Mason. A sign. It is this, I answered, producing from beneath the folds of my roccolore a trowel. You jest, but let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior crypt or recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use within itself but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, therein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese... He is an ignoramus interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links around his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nighter. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado. True, I replied. The Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself upon the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I'd scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low, moaning cry from the depths of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction, 
I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. <laughs> For a brief moment, I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid brick of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this. And the clamor grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out of the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, Ah, uh, <laughs> a very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about this at the Palazzo. Over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado? Uh, <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But it is not getting late will they not be waiting for us at the palazzo the lady fortunato and the rest let us be gone yes let us be gone for the love of god montresor yes for the love of god but to these words i hearken in vain for reply i grew impatient i called aloud fortunato no answer I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end to my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. And that is going to do it for this episode of Spooky Stories from Mind Over Murder. We hope you enjoyed this bonus content. And everybody give a round of applause to Mr. Bill Thomas for a rousing performance as Fortunato. And to Kristen Dilly for her outstanding performance and acting as our narrator as well. That was a lot of fun. And look for interesting, spooky bonus content like this for the whole entire rest of the month of October. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. Thanks for listening to this bonus episode. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.